Hello everyone, we are back and now we are going to be talking about trade and economics in Europe. Let's not waste time, let's get right into it. Okay, for most of the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages or the Medieval period, again and again, we have what was known as the matter system. This is what we talk about where life being intensely local. You would basically have it set up that you would be able to do everything that you needed in one general location that might be a few hundred acres. As you can see by the diagram here on the top right, you have the Lord's Manor House, or sometimes that might even be a castle, um, where he and his family would work out of. Uh, there would be a village, or could be a couple different villages, where the peasants would live. Um, each area would have a blacksmith's forge, a mill. Here you have the village green, which would often be for children or even livestock. You would have a tithe barn. That's where everything, where the church would go. Uh, vegetables. You'd have a common area, and a lot of times you'd have the livestock here. Um, these fallow fields, they knew that if you... Uh, every single year farm a field it will damage the soil so at least once a year one or two fields would be left fallow or not used which would be incredibly effective and you would have a mill for the grinding of grain and maybe a grape press for wine depending on where you live um, you would have a potterer you would have a carpenter and guys it really was good. I mean, it was very, very effective. Now, the negative to that is that you wouldn't necessarily have really much in the way of trade, but the fact of the matter is people didn't need it. Now, it really depended on who, who your lord was. If he took his duties seriously, your life would actually be pretty good. If he was cruel and taxed the crap out of you, your life would generally stink. So... It really depends on what it was like, but this was how everything was run for a number of hundreds of years. Now, what also helps here and will help expand everything was that agricultural boom. And I talked about it already in feudalism that you have the medieval warm period in which they're able to grow tremendous amounts of crops, particularly cereal crops like all types of grains and barley and wheat and things like that. They also had some great advances like uh, the horseshoe, which would allow horses to uh, pull plows a lot better. Um, the harness, which would be able to have the weight of a plow be on a horse or cow's shoulders, not their neck or you know basically their chest. And it allowed for greater farming, more food, a population boom. And as a result, once again, just like we talk about in ancient times, as you start getting bigger populations, guess what? Everybody doesn't have to be a farmer. And as a result of that, we will start seeing people look to trade. And the group that was really on the forefront of this was the Republic of Venice. Yes, Venice. It was a republic. It lasted from 697 to 1797. People don't realize that this area lasted for a thousand years. Um, as you can see, the map on the right. Uh, you can see the city of Venice, and they would control these areas down parts of modern-day Italy into, like, Macedonia and Greece and many of these other islands. Um, they had their own navy. They were incredibly powerful. They had a merchant fleet and a military fleet. You can really liken these guys to the Athenians back in the classical Greek period. Um... And one of the thing about them is that they were a small area. They didn't have tons of farmland, so they traded. They traded with the Ottomans. They traded with the Arabs. They traded with Jews. And what it allowed them to do was to really expand their power but start to bring in more knowledge and things along that line that we're going to be getting to. Um, they will have contacts with just about everyone that you could imagine. And it really made them tremendously powerful. You see here they had a cool flag and a griffin and all sorts of stuff. Um, 
Actually, I think that's a chimera. My bad. Not a griffin. A chimera. But whatever. But they are really going to push the envelope. The Pope is actually going to allow them to intermingle with Muslims and other groups because they're making so much money. And they are going to be kind of the model that other groups will start to take after when they see how much revenue these guys are able to make. And one Venetian in general that will really be influential in helping to reignite trade will be Marco Polo, who lived from 1254 to 1325. He was also from Venice. When he was a young man, his father and uncle traveled to China, and eventually they will come back scoop up a young Marco uh, when he's a young man. He's actually 17. Uh, he will go on a journey from the years 1271 to 1294, so 25 years, in which he will go, as you can see here, all the way across Central Asia into areas like Afghanistan, modern-day Uzbekistan, across the Gobi Desert, into the land of Kublai Khan, and from there, we'll also travel down the coast of China, hit modern-day Vietnam, Indonesia, sail across the Indian Ocean, visit India, visit Iran, then travel back overland eventually through Venice. Uh, for a short while, he was actually a functionary in the government of Kublai Khan. And he, you know, the journey or just his life was really remarkable. Now, his impact was quite huge. Um, as he was getting a little bit older, he did fight in a war between Venice and Genoa, uh, in which he was captured and thrown in jail for a number of years. And with a man by the name of Rusticello de Pisa, he writes his most famous work, The Travels of Marco Polo. Now, initially, many people did not believe him, but a number of them would. And what you start to have happening is that many uh, merchants start to try to reestablish the overland trade in the Silk Roads, and his works will be tremendously influential on the explorers that we will be talking about in the future. Uh, guys like Christopher Columbus was said to have had his own copy of The Travels of Marco Polo, which really inspired him on his journeys. Now, continental Europe will finally start to kind of catch back up to everything with the growth of the town. Because you have so many people now, and because not everybody needs to be a farmer, many of these villages will start to grow. And what happens with that growth is that people start to specialize, and you get the growth of these craftsmen that will start to travel around. We've already talked about the troubadours that are going to start to travel around. And eventually we will see the reemergence of the merchant class. And what many peasants had a realization of was that if they moved to a town, they might have an opportunity to actually make their lives a little bit better, especially if they didn't want to be a farmer. And as you can see here, this picture of a town, well, you got some beggars, that's going to happen. But you've got these different merchants, and you've got performers over here, and a tavern over here. And you really see butchers and bakers and you know, maybe a candlestick maker. But you also have you know, brewers and, and glass makers and all of these artisans that start to grow up and the merchants that are starting to trade things. And eventually it will lead to something known as the Hanseatic League, as you see down here. What the Hanseatic League was, was a, um association of trading cities that started over here in Novgorod and eventually went to areas like London and up to Edinburgh in Scotland. And this was really, really huge because you have trade that goes from Russia to Poland to Scandinavia and England. These guys will also protect each other. The governments in this area, realizing the benefit they can get from the taxation of these individuals and these merchants, will start to do things to foster trade. You're going to get capitalism starting to kind of pick up the pace here. And with trade will come the spread of knowledge, which of course will also be very, very important. And the Hanseatic League was crucial 
um, you would have these again cities and then if you look at these uh, triangles these fairs that once or twice during the year merchants would gather in say Berlin or Frankfurt and people would come to trade things and it really was incredible and what also started to reestablish this was um, banking and guilds. Banks are reestablished most notably by the Templar Knights who actually came out of the Crusades. And they very much were banks like you would see today, banks that would allow people to deposit and store money. But these banks would also start to finance journeys and businesses and this is going to be really, really important because that will allow merchants to grow because they can get the funding for things like ships. And then you have the development of the guilds. These are really your early unions. Guilds would be put together to run professions in towns. And as you can see there, you have a tailor's guild and a cooper's guild and a miller's guild. And the only way that you would be able to actually practice that profession in a particular city or area is you had to be part of the guild. And you would actually pay a certain amount of your profits each year to the guilds. Now, what the guilds were also able to do would be to, uh, or they would have the purpose of bettering the quality of goods, making sure that people were experts. Uh, there was a long process. You would actually first have to be an apprentice, and then after you were an apprentice, you would uh, start to get the right to make some things on your own, and eventually you would have to demonstrate your skills to show that you were a master, and then you could open your own shop. These guilds would grow and grow until eventually some of them became powerful enough that, for instance, they would run many city-states actually in Italy, and we'll be talking about this during the Renaissance, like most notably Florence uh, and others would actually be run by these trade guilds. So here again you see the importance or the power of um, the economics in political life. And so this is what we see. We see this small local trade in Europe start with the manor system. You start to get more population that will develop in the growth of the town. And then people start to become merchants again, and they will start to travel from town to town. And then we have the development of the leagues and the banks. And Europe is really on the cusp of exploding. And when they have that wealth, it's going to be amazing to see what they do with it. All right, guys, I will see you tomorrow. Get your questions and comments. See you then.